Wind has been a very important energy source in the past. Before the industrial age and the invention of the steam engine, basically the use of this resource has totally shaped our lives. For example, sailing was the dominant means for long distance transportation and many um, scientific discoveries, explorations, trade missions have crucially depended on that. Wind turbines have not only been used for milling, but also for actually for lifting water in the polar areas, for drainage, for pumping. But today, wind turbines are the cornerstones of the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy provision. And here I listed the targets for 2020 in the Netherlands. We want to bolster up in 14% in renewable energies and bringing down the CO2 emissions by 20%. That is, of course, a very important target because uh, we need to actually counteract global warming. And if we don't succeed in this ambitious plan, we have to build these dikes in the future a lot higher, and I don't think that this is really a clever solution to the problem. And how are we going to do this now? Well, we are building wind turbines. In the 80s, we were at 16-meter rotor diameter wind turbines but up to now, we have reached something like 160 uh, meter diameter uh, wind turbines. These are colossal structures, and I think everyone has seen them. So the question is, why do we go bigger over time? Well, this is triggered on the one hand by efficiency increase. The bigger you build a flow turbine, the more efficient you can make it. But also, the higher you reach, uh, with the turbines, the higher the energy density that you can harvest. But there is obviously a limit, although we built turbines that are approaching the wingspan of an Airbus 380, there is a limit. It's a structural limit. We just simply cannot build tower-based turbines that can actually reach into several hundred meter altitude. So the question is, can we ever build high-altitude wind power plants like this utopian vision from uh, 1932? The answer is clear, not with today's uh, construction techniques, absolutely not. So, then the question is, how can we access the wind potential at higher altitude that is out of reach for current tower-based designs? But let us step back for a moment back to the Earth's surface and see how we are dealing there with the energy transition. Well, the way that we address this is by actually plastering large parts of our landscape with wind turbines. And in itself, this is good because we do need to make the energy transition, but it has created a lot of problems. Not only that these turbines are covering large areas, and many people do not want them anymore, but they also harm animals. They are a hazard to the wildlife. Uh, it's a visual obstruction. Um, they, they make a lot of noise, so, and they waste a lot of materials. A lot of steel goes into the construction of these turbines. So, Logically, and this, this actually was banned by many uh, regions or governments, they put a ban on onshore wind turbines. So, what is the next logical step? We go offshore. We are building large offshore wind parks. That is good because we have laminar flow, very strong wind, so this is quite efficient. But it is economically questionable because you need a very expensive energy network in the ocean to bring the energy where it's produced to the shoreline. Also maintenance, service, this is all 
quite expensive for offshore wind turbines. But then we even do the next step and we tow the turbines to the open sea on large offshore platforms. Again, this is um, probably not economically viable solution for the future. So we see we actually hit the limit of tower-based turbine structures. And how can we address the problem now in a different way? Maybe we are thinking here too much inside the box. So let's get out, look at the concept of the wind turbine, and we actually realize that um, the last 25% of the rotor blade, they actually make more than 50% of the energy. So why don't we decouple the rotor blade from the hub and actually move it as a free-flying wing into the air. In this way, we can fly at high speed and have a very high energy density on this wing. We put the generator onto the ground, we connect that with a, with a very strong and lightweight tether, which actually converts the traction force of the wing uh, transmits that to the generator with a little drum and a generator to convert that into electricity. So much for the concept. How are we going to do this? Kites, it was already announced. We have here one of our species, 25 square meter in size. But kites have actually a history. They were around 1900. Kites were used in a lot of technical applications, aerial photography, for example, weather observation to lift people up high into the air. Um, the altitude record from 1919 is still persisting. Kites, uh, to be precise, eight box kites uh, on a single tether have reached an altitude of almost 10 kilometers. That is actually at the outer perimeter of the atmosphere. Quite amazing. These days, kites are used more as sport devices still, and again, we use them to break records. And here you see the speed record in 2010 in, uh, in Africa, uh, riding 103 kilometers per hour. This is still two kilometers per hour faster than the fastest sailboat on this planet. So, Kites are clearly having a very powerful, um, a, a, a very large power to pull things. We use them now also to experiment with the ship traction, and here you see a small example, a catamaran pulled by this 25 square meter kite, but they are also used by, to pull larger ships. For example, the German-based company Skysails, they have uh, kites of 150 to 300 square meter size to pull large container vessels through the ocean, by that saving between 30 and 40 percent in fuel. That is a quite important thing to realize. We have built, our team at TU Delft has built a kite power system which I have depicted here. Can we please go back? We have the 25 square meter wing. We have an aerial robot. This is this little box dangling below the kite. It's used for steering and depowering. And on the ground, you see the ground station with the generator and the drum, actually. The most important components are the kite itself and the control unit. This is the high tech that we have been developing. And the kite that you see here is controlled by this little box. And it's coming also here from the ceiling. So this little box is basically suspended 10 meters below the kite. It has two very powerful motor winches. Each of these can pull 100 kilo, and by that steering this kite, this kite produces something like 300 to 500 kilogram traction force. That is half a ton, and that is all mastered by these two little winches. It has a wireless connection to the ground where the control computer sits, basically the brain of this uh, unit. And the basic idea is, and I leave this here now alone, Go back. 
<clears throat> the basic idea is that we can use this control unit to fly very high up on a pre prescribed trajectory to harvest energy. So it's an aerial robot application. And in the following slide, I show you basically how the energy production works. So we only spoke until now about traction force conversion, but at some point, your kite will reach a very high altitude. And we want continuous energy generation. What we do is we operate the kite in some kind of yo-yo cycle. So we go up and down, up and down. In the outgoing phase that is depicted here on the top half, we have figure eight flight maneuvers for high traction force. We produce energy. When we pull the kite back in, we bring it into a gliding motion using a little bit of that energy that we produce. That is actually demonstrated here. We see the kite flying, the control unit for steering and depowering, the traction tether going down to the ground station operating on the drum and the generator. We fly figure of eight motions. We basically charge a big battery pack that we have on ground or the network connection. When we reach top, we depower and pull back, which uses a little bit of the energy that we actually just produced. So, this is the concept, and we do have now a 20 kilowatt um, mobile unit. And the idea is that such a mobile unit is, of course, quite... Uh, it can be used for, for example, for remote applications, um, development areas, disaster areas, all these places where you need energy quickly and you don't have oil or a fuel. So, this is where this comes of large use. And the idea is, I'm showing you here a short sequence of the system in operation. The idea is that the kite system, it can adapt itself to the altitude where the actual wind power is. So if there is little wind at the ground, we just fly higher where the wind is typically stronger. If the wind there is too strong, we can go lower again. So we can adjust the system and in this way, we basically have more availability of power. So this is a clear advantage when comparing to traditional tower-based wind turbines. The other advantage is the wing, as it flies through the sky, is soft. It's a soft structure that is quite safe in comparison, in comparison to wind turbine blades. So this is also a nice uh, feature of that system, safety. And of course, the idea is that for the future, we take a lot of these kites and a lot of ground units, we put them on arrays on the ground, and we basically operate kite systems out of phase to have them arranged in a complete wind park that can produce uh, energy on the megawatt scale. And here is an example from Friesland, where we actually did a demonstration of our kite system going up to 700 meter altitude where there was strong wind and we were producing quite 20 kilowatts of power. Thank you very much.